So it's with great honor that I would like to bring up Chairman Omari Nishitela. to undermine this effort of Nkrumah 
able to pull together one single African state, one single African government. Liberia and Tubman there played a real serious role. They were the ones who talked about gradualism, sing home. They didn't want to see uh, this happen, uh, partially because they wanted to protect their own little uh, fiefdoms of uh, where they were located. The imperialists went on a serious media campaign uh, that demonized Nkrumah, characterized him as somebody who simply wanted to be the president of all of Africa. That's why he was pushing this. Uh, playing on the egos of the, of the petty uh, puppet puppets that the imperialists themselves had put in power in most of these 32 different states. And they succeeded in preventing the consolidation of a single united Africa. And instead, what was put in place was this thing that they call the Organization of African Unity. And enshrined in the, in the uh, codified, uh, in the principles of the Organization of African Unity was respect for the colonial borders. This was, this was in the, in the uh, charter of the Afri Organization of African Unity, respect for the colonial borders. You know the borders in Africa today were borders that were created by white power. They sat down around a table in Berlin, Germany, 1884 and 85. And they shared out different parts of Africa to different imperialist forces. And they did this because for centuries they had been fighting over Africa in order to prevent this next war among white power over what part of Africa each was going to get. You know how even the best of mafioso uh, deals fall apart when one gets a bit greedy or one feels like uh, he didn't get what he should have got. And so in order to prevent this war from happening, a, a conference was called in Berlin, Germany, among the imperialist forces, and they began to divide Africa and share Africans out among each other. And all of these so-called African states that you see on the map, all of these so-called African countries that you see on the map, and many people even refer to them as different nations, uh, uh, these uh, were creations of Europe and European imperialist white power, and it was an attack on the effort by Kwame Nkrumah to organize one Africa and one nation. This is something that you must understand. And the war against Nkrumah did not end on that day. In fact, three years after the founding of the Organization of African Unity, Nkrumah was overthrown uh, with, the, with the leadership of U.S. imperialism and then white liberal imperialist president Lyndon Baines Johnson. They overthrew uh, Nkrumah and because of his vision for a free and prosperous Africa with the resources of Africa going to benefit Africa and African people. And now they left in place this thing called the Organization of African Unity uh, that many people still celebrate today, but it was something that actually was an attack on the struggle to build one Africa, one nation. So we are here today because that work is unfinished. And it is important to be here today because that work is unfinished and it is important to use African Liberation Day as a means to further that work. Because although the Organization of African Unity was a, an imperialist inspired creation, it was at this May 25th, 1963 event that it was declared that this would be African Liberation Day, commemorating the founding of the Organization of African Unity. So we take this date of May 25th, and we embrace this date of May 25th because it reminds us of the work that has to be done because Africa is not free. Africa suffers mightily, but it suffers in a changing world. And I think it's important for us to say that when we talk about the liberation of Africa and a changing world, we're not talking about an Africa in a vacuum. There's something that's happening in the world and we must contextualize the struggle to liberate and unify Africa and the struggle to free ourselves. We must talk about what is happening in the world today that influences what it is that we are trying to do in this meeting and in all the work that we should be involved in. First of all, I want to say that my objective here 
and the objective of the African People's Socialist Party in sponsoring African Liberation Day is to win active participation in the revolution to free African people. That we don't believe in just doing events for events' sake. That we're not involved in simply having events that we want to organize our people. We have to organize our people to make a revolution so that we can free ourselves, we can free our continent, and the resources that are the birthright of black people all around the world can be recaptured and put in our own hands. That's why we're here. That's what this is about. That's what the crew was about. That's what Marcus Garvey was about. Not holding events, but winning freedom. Yes. And unfortunately, since the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s, and you know that revolution was defeated. When I talk about a defeated revolution, I'm not simply talking about what happened to the Black Panther Party. I'm talking about what happened to us around the world. I'm talking about the murder of Patrice Lumumba. I'm talking about the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah. I'm talking about the capture and murder of Che Guevara in, in, in Bolivia. I'm talking about a revolution that had defined the trajectory of human history at one point and it was stalled and pushed back by U.S. imperialism, by murder, and by the, the arrest and imprisonment of thousands of our people here and around the world. That's what we are, that's what we are about completing today. And that revolution was crushed. And the bodies were living all around the world. And what was this revolution about? This was not a revolution to oppress anybody. It was a revolution to end the oppression of everybody. That's what it was about. It was a revolution so that our children could know a future. Because in this world that we live in today, half the people on earth live off less than $2.75 U.S. cents a day. Half the people on the planet Earth live off less than $2.75. On this, on, in this world that we live in today, at this time, we're talking about a situation where 80% of the people on the planet Earth try to survive off $10 or less a day. That is not acceptable. It is not acceptable to me, it's not acceptable to you, and it's not that they're acceptable to anybody. And of course, of course, what we are told is that this is not a consequence of a social system, a social system that was born in slavery, wasn't it? Born of slavery, born of genocide. We are told that it is the ineptitude of the non-white people of the world that's responsible for this great disparity in wealth and resources that exist today. We're saying that we don't suffer because we are inept. We're not impoverished because we are inept. The people who work all day on the continent of Africa, all day just for a single meal, are not doing it because we are inept. We are doing it because a social system was born at our expense. That's why that is happening. What am I talking about? I'm talking about today. We have a situation where capitalism shakily continues to dominate the world. It is a world economy, this thing capitalism. It is an economy, a whole social system that was born of slavery. You know that. This is a question that, that has dumbfounded, confounded many of us growing up as a child. I had to ask myself why I was everywhere I looked in the world. I could see that people who looked like me were poor, were steeped in ignorance, and had brutality imposed on us on the one hand, violence imposed on us on the one hand, and everywhere I looked, people who were white were doing all right. People who were white were well off, but we were doing poorly. And of course, the explanation we always got for that was that white people did well as compared to us because white people were more civilized than we are. You've heard it before. Or if not, that is because white people are thrifty and we are not thrifty. We waste all of our money, uh, etc. This is the simple-minded kind of explanation that was imposed on us. Of course, I don't know too many people who believe it, uh, except those uh, people who Malcolm X characterized as house Negroes. Uh, but it didn't matter whether you believed it or not because they had all the guns, didn't they? Uh, you can be convinced of almost anything if somebody's standing over you with a gun willing to use it and brutalize you all the time. But this is the explanation that we were given. And we had no idea. Many of us were separated from our own history because that's one of the first things that they did to us when they captured us and brutalized us is to separate you from your history. So we had no idea that the world that we lived in was one, first of all, where in a few short years, three or four short years between the 1346 and 
in, in 1351, half the white people on earth died. Did you know that? They died of plague. They call it the Black Plague. At least half of all the white people on planet earth died in four years. And then even after that time frame, there were, there were that and other plagues continued to sweep Europe, wiping them out. You cannot lose half of a population and have anything that approximates a viable economic life. You lose half of the people in four years, you don't have an economy. So how did Europe rescue itself from this state of, of uh, terrible poverty and this, this, this uh, state of affairs where people were dying like flies? I said, that people were dying like flies, everything was dying. Uh, horses were dying, cows were dying, literally dogs were dying all over Europe. In fact, uh, the Pope, who was supposed to have this special relationship with God, was so frightened by what happened is that he got out of town. He literally left and found and went into the countryside running from the plague. Many so-called Christians of the moment believed that uh, it was, uh, they were dying like this because God was, uh, was visiting a special uh, kind of uh, terror against them because they had sinned so mightily. Christian sects were developed uh, where people actually got involved in self-flagellation. Hundreds of them would be marching throughout Europe, recruiting more, beating themselves with chains and things like that to try to pre up God. So maybe if I hurt myself bad enough, God won't get me. This is the terror of the plague. And yet, what are we told? That explains how Europe got to be what it is as compared to the rest of us. We told that Europe, uh, white people left Europe because they had an adventurous streak. That they had a curiosity itch that had to be scratched. Uh, they wanted to find out if the world was really flat or not. We, we told that they had a nutmeg shortage and they were looking for spices.
enslavement uh, 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 between Spain and Portugal. You have this part and you can have that part. They've been splitting the world since then among themselves, right. occupying the world themselves against the will and interest and aspiration and happiness and future of everybody else. That's what's been going on. Karl Marx, who some white folks used to love, offered an explanation also about how this thing that they call capitalism that Barack Hussein Obama is involved in now using all means to try and protect and defend. He, he talked about capitalism having as a major impetus the rape of Africa. He called it turning Africa into a warrant for the commercial hunting of black skins. Because you've got to ask the question, how did capitalism get here? Was it something that Jesus dropped off on Calvary? How did capitalism get here? Was, it, was is there really a Santa Claus that brings to all the good, meaning white people, goodies and misery to the rest of us? How did capitalism get here? And Marx was able to say that he called this thing primitive accumulation of capital. Because he's speaking from the perspective of somebody who, a uh, society that has benefited from capitalism. It's because he was able to say that capitalism was progressive in the development of human society. And he said that, that uh, it was turning Africa into a war for the commercial hunting of black skins. It was taking the so-called Indians in the Americas and putting them into mines, bringing up gold and silver that went into Europe. It was the opium war fought by England. You know what I'm talking about, old proper tea sipping England against the Chinese because they wanted China to take opium from them and they would take Chinese tea, but the China didn't want to trade with them, didn't want their opium. But England then, what did it do? Did it say, okay, you, you don't want to trade? Uh, maybe if you don't want opium, uh, we make a pretty good clock that we'd like to trade with you? No, they initiated the war, the so-called opium war. 1841-42, England launched a war against China to force China to become a nation of junkies, drug addicts, for the tea. England is known for its tea sipping. You know that, don't you? But you all, England is not known for having tea leaf trees. They don't produce tea trees or tea leaves in England. They fought and forced China to do that. And so you had developing here this thing that Karl Marx called the primitive accumulation of capital. And critical, fundamental to this whole production was Africa and what they characterized as a slave trade. The war that was launched on Africa that's responsible for our being here. The war that was launched on Africa that's responsible for our being here. The war that was launched on Africa that is responsible for many of us not knowing what our names are. The war that was launched on Africa that's responsible for the, uh, the assault on belief systems that held us together. The war that was made on Africa that's responsible for the tremendous transfer of wealth and resources from Africa to the white world. This was part of what they were talking about when, they, when Marx talked about the primitive accumulation of capital that made capitalism possible. This was the fundamental component that went into the development of the capitalist social system itself. In the beginning, you have a starving, impoverished, and unfree Europe. You know there was no freedom in Europe. They taught you that when you went to elementary school. Among the lies they told you, uh, they told you that they said when, when Europeans came to uh, America, they were looking for what they call it, freedom of religion. Isn't that what they said? They were looking for, they had no freedom. They had no freedom there. In fact, the state of Georgia in this country was formed, formed founded as a prison colony by England. Australia was stolen and taken from the, where the people murdered as a prison colony for England. There was no freedom for white people. There was no freedom for Europeans.
and then they launched this war, but you cannot find evidence of a jail or a prison in the indigenous population here or in Africa before the white man came. No evidence of a jail or a prison here or in Africa before the Europeans attacked us. I, I hate people who lie on, on white people. It's absolutely unnecessary. Radio, 
uh, at least by next Sunday, perhaps even on tomorrow, uh, there's a possibility you will begin to hear reports directly from what's happening in Stockholm because we are there organizing in the African community. Hold on your hand, Canada. We're organizing uh, in Canada. We're organizing. We're organizing right now uh, uh, in Kenya. We're organizing in Sierra Leone. In just a few days, some of the people in this room will be traveling to Kenya where we are conducting a national conference, uh, not, not Kenya, but to Sierra Leone. And we've been organized there for a number of years. We're organizing in South Africa. We even have an organizer in Cairo. God had told us that we have to have a single organization that can lead our struggle on every front. Good 
laws they put in place. That's why America's sweeping the earth now looking for good Muslims, you understand? Let's find some good Muslims, so somebody who will denounce and the rest of the Muslims who are out there talking about kill the white man. They need Negroes like that. But it's a statement of some significance. I mean, if you think about this, who would have said that uh, 10 years ago that a Negro, uh, uh, six years ago, a Negro would be the President of the United States of America? It goes against the grain. It goes against everything. It goes against the philosophy, the ideology of imperialism. It's a statement about just how far they had to dig, how deep they had to dig as a, as a, in a struggle to try to rescue a social system that's on rocky ground. It's on rocky ground that is everywhere you look in the world today. You see economic crisis, don't you? Look at what you see happening in Greece. Look at what you see happening in Italy, France, Ireland. Uh, all over the white world, right world, you see people rising up, fighting against what's happening to them. Why are they rising up? Why is there economic crisis? Why is there economic crisis in this country? There's economic crisis. They say, well, it's because of the, the, the housing bubble burst. No, what burst is this illusion? Yeah. <laughs> it's an illusion that's, that's uh, burst. It's the illusion that the rest of the world uh, were dependents. We are dependent countries. We are dependent. No, what's dependent is white power that's dependent on being able to continue to steal out of resources. And what has been happening, especially since the Second Imperialist World War, you know the one they call World War II? You know the one they sometimes refer to as the last good war that America has fought? Well, that war, just like everyone that has had, has been a war to read about in the world. That, that war that was fought against Hitler, who they said they were fighting Hitler because he was such a despot, he was such a person who was, uh, they even said he was crazy, right? Who was against freedom, etc. Here is a war that's been fought in Germany at the time of lynching was a national pastime in this country. It's a war that was been fought in Germany at a time where lynching black people was the national pastime, surpassing baseball and the rest of their other uh, harmless games that, uh, that they were engaged in. And so they're going to fight a war for democracy. And you believe that, don't you? There's a war that they had to fight that they even had to, the army segregated. <laughs> a war for democracy. Yeah. No, it was a war to read about the world. And uh, who was going to get this part of Africa? Who was going to get this part of Asia, et cetera? And of course, out of that war, the U.S. emerged as the supreme power on Earth. Biggest economy, strongest economy, Europe devastated by war. The, uh, the U.S. had dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. You're talking about terrorism. They didn't drop bombs on people who were fighting wars. These were bombs dropped on cities where babies and children civilians were slaughtered. No, they can never tell me anything about a so-called war against terrorism. If the United States were engaged in a war against terrorism, it had to commit suicide. Yeah. It had to commit suicide. And so, and so uh, the people have been rising up, taking back their resources. People all over South America. Do you know that one time they took so much silver out of the mines of Peru that they almost destroyed the economy of Spain. It was bringing, because the economy of Spain was based on silver. They brought so much silver and dumped it into the economy and almost wiped the economy out. This, this is how Europe got wealthy. This is how Europe rescued itself after the so-called the, the, the so Black Plague. This was not a Europe had freedom. Europeans lived under what they call feudalism. You know what feudalism was, don't you? For a thousand years, for a thousand years, white people lived under feudalism in Europe. This is the, the time that created the myth of Robin Hood. You know, robbing from the rich to give to the poor, where the sheriff dominated everything, stealing taxes and everything the poor had, where the people were tied to the land, where they didn't live. Listen, people were so poor, and this is the literal truth. I'm not, again, I don't mean to lie on white people. People were so poor that in some instances, people literally went naked because they had nothing to wear in Europe. And for a thousand years, Europe struggled.
struggle under feudal domination, where the lords, the nobility, dominated everything, owned everything. Let's go. Man's home is his castle, my butt. The only castles that were around were the, the nobility was located there. And somebody was tied to the land. And even though they couldn't be sold into slavery like what happened to us, if the land was sold, they went with the land to the next owner. This was feudalism in Europe. There was no freedom. What freedom? How did white people gain freedom? How did white people, ordinary white people, get property? They came to places like this. Europeans are not indigenous to these lands, whether they're in Canada or Australia or this land that they call the United States of America. The people who are indigenous to this land, those who are surviving, are living today in concentration camps that they call Indian Reservation. This is the America that Barack Hussein Obama is talking about protecting. You understand? This is the reality that we are up against, that we are contending with now. But it's a system in severe distress. Severe distress everywhere. So much distress that people, you, you open the newspaper, go on the internet, turn on television, and there's war, struggle everywhere on the earth. There's no peace. Yeah. And there shouldn't be no peace as long as people are oppressed. Shouldn't be no peace. Shouldn't be no peace. I know there's a white left that walks out around talking about peace, peace, peace. <laughs> we organized an entity called the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations. Now that's the combination we can deal with. Yes. There should be no peace without social justice. There will be no peace without social justice. Right. And there damn sure won't be any peace unless we get some reparations. And people are saying, well, you know, it is the law. Hell, slavery was the law. Slavery was legal. If you tried to get away from slavery, you broke the law. They put Nat Turner on trial before they killed him. Yes. 
How could the law be anything other than that? Those of us who have any understanding of political economy understand our society itself, understand that the economy is the base of society, isn't it? This economy is the base of society. And upon this base, depending on what kind of economy you have, there emerges a superstructure, isn't that right? And the superstructure is the legal system, the philosophy, even religion and what have you, reflects the superstructure, it reflects the base of that society. So, so terrorism then, coming out of that society, will be anything that attacks and undermines that society, you will be a terrorist. Right, right. That's why the Ku Klux Klan has never been characterized as a terrorist organization. Right. You ever hear them say the Klan is a terrorist organization? They say a, a, a terrorist organization, according to Barack Hussein Obama and, and Holder, uh, is one that they got a list. They write down who is the terrorist. And they say that if you have anything to do or support a so-called terrorist, they can put you in jail. Yeah. That means if you say, I free Assad or Shakur, yeah. that means you're abating terrorism. Yeah. That means they can have the whole African community yeah. locked up. That's why everybody got to say, free Assad, hands off of Assad or Shakur. <laughs> everybody got to say it. And, and Holder, I want you to come yourself to get me. Free Assad now. Free Assad. Free Assad. Free Assad. Yeah. So, it's a serious situation. I just want to say a couple of other things to you. Because uh, I'm clearly off script. <laughs> but I want to say that um, it's really important for us to recognize that the 1960s was, was an incredible historical moment. I'm saying this not out of some kind of nostalgia. Because uh, the Chinese, I think, said it best. They said that it was a time where there was great disorder under the heavens, where revolution was the main trend in the entire world, where everybody was trying to win their freedom. And the imperialists succeeded in crushing that revolutionary movement. They, after, after the Nicaraguans won it, and of course Nicaragua happened so soon after uh, Iran. And Iran was a real problem for them because Iran, along with the white nationalist uh, settler state of Israel that sits on occupied Palestine, uh, then Iran, boom, you know, uh, uh, Iran uh, was functioning as the, as the uh, extended uh, uh, military force, the uh, base of operation for U.S. imperialism. It was to protect uh, the oil industry along with Europe. And what made Iran uh, with, along with Israel? And what made Iran and Israel significant is you got Arabs in this area where much of the oil, most of the oil is located. And Israel, a bunch of white people, some from Milwaukee and others from Russia and other places, because Golda Meir, the school teacher, was from Milwaukee, who became president of Israel, said God gave it to him 2,000 years ago. And I guess, uh, you know, that's a hell of a real estate agent, you know. <laughs> uh, and so the white people there uh, uh, who have no uh, relationship to the Arabs and are hostile because they they are interlopers who have still stolen their land, uh, et cetera. They can be trusted. And then you got in Iran, the Iranians are not Arabs either. They're Persians. So they felt like they could trust these guns and weapons with the white people uh, in occupied Palestine that they call Israel and with the Persians in Iran. These were the thugs who were going to keep the oil and resources safe uh, for white power. And of course, uh, what happened in Iran, as you know, is that uh, they overthrew the Shah there, and they've been and they took and they don't, not only did they take the freedom, but they took all the guns and airplanes and everything else the U.S. had given to the Shah in order to protect their interests. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, you had uh, the situation that it's been a part of a changing landscape in the world. This has been going on for a while, since the Second Imperialist War. And now uh, it has reached a certain kind of crescendo 
where you can't look any place without uh, seeing the people fighting to take back their resources. Except what you see as an imperialism in trouble, and how does it attempt to rescue itself? Well, right now, uh, a major thrust is being made against Africa. You see that uh, uh, Canada has an Africa plan, America has an Africa plan, uh, France has an Africa plan, uh, England has an Africa plan, uh, uh, China has an Africa plan, India has an Africa plan. You've got all of the imperialists that are in trouble scrambling to get to try and rescue themselves by digging deeper into the continent of Africa. All of the new hustlers uh, on the block, uh, China, India, et cetera, going uh, into Africa to try and build themselves. Uh, and, and of course, you've got the neo-colonial puppets. They don't give a damn if it's Chinese, Indian, uh, France, or America, as long as they can get their cut. Right? And I'm talking about on the continent of Africa itself. You've got these puppet so-called leaders that don't represent Africa and African people. That's why the African People's Socialist Party and the African Socialist International, we have an Africa plan too. And this Africa plan means that we have to make revolution, that we have to put down on the ground every place Africans are located on the planet Earth, revolutionary organization with the objective of taking power. Taking power! Everywhere we are, we're not talking about getting along with neo-colonial puppet regimes. We're talking about we have to organize and train people to put them in place. We have to prepare to govern. We have to prepare to govern. We have to prepare to govern. If we are serious, if we're not talking about power, we're just talking about having another event. I'm tired of simply going to events. So that's what we are working for. That's what Nkrumah was working for. That's what Garvey was working for. And that's why we built the, the African Socialist International. And a, a major thrust we're involved in now is the economic front, the Black Star Industries. And Black Star Industries uh, is a beginning. It is a non-capitalist, anti-colonialist economic piece of work that we are in, have initiated. We, we exist uh, in this country. Uh, we are licensed to do business uh, in Europe. Uh, we are in the process. I left Ghana two days ago uh, where we are looking at some land. And you should be interested in this, perhaps, because part of what we're trying to do in Ghana, this is Garvey. We're looking at some land where we can actually establish an African community, a prototype, based on African socialist, uh, African internationalist principles, uh, based on uh, 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 that we want to model uh, based on what we need, where we can actually have production going on, on that, in that community that can be solar and wind powered uh, in terms of energy and the rest of it, that can be integrated into that African community in Ghana and build a real revolutionary base that's there. It's not the answer to anything, but it can be a prototype. It can show what is capable, what we are capable of doing. And we want to attract Africans from throughout the African world to come in and participate in that project, in that process. We are talking about the Black Star Industries. All of the economic work that we do is now not all of it, because as you heard, uh, we do other kinds of economic work. We created a number of nonprofits. Uh, like in Sierra Leone right now, we do work. Is, is there on the program a discussion around the work we're doing in Sierra Leone? Uh, we do um, amazingly uh, important work in Sierra Leone right now. Uh, but we also uh, uh, have created, like, the Burning Spear newspaper, uh, Burning Spear, uh, the Uhuru radio station, uh, Uhuru Foods, and other projects that we have created, all of these fall under uh, Black Star Industries. This is an economic front of our work. This is an incipient uh, attempt. This is an attempt to build a, a national economy for African people. As China and everybody else is moving throughout Africa, and China is the fastest growing economic force on the continent of Africa today, you cannot go anywhere in Africa that you do not see Chinese. Everywhere in Africa. And the thing is that, that the people who, do, who are doing best in Africa are people who are not of Africa. You understand what I just said? Right now, the most successful economic forces in Africa are not people of Africa. There are other peoples who have come to Africa and who are, who are involved in a process that goes from gentrification 
lamps driving up land prices and, and everything, whether it was starving and desperate people, losing land rights and resources, uh, mines, uh, you know, the name, the, the, the totality. So we have to build an economic front. If you're serious about freedom, this is what Garvey understood. You got to have an economic front. Black Star Industries represents our move in that direction. It's a small move at this juncture. It's small because the numbers of people who are aware of it, who've been brought into the process, are small. But all of us are going to have to participate in supporting Black Star Industries. Up to now, what we've done is create a situation where uh, some businesses will be created here throughout Europe, in Africa, where depending on the business, uh, the people or individuals who create the business can own up to 49%. The party, Black Star Industries will own uh, at least 51% of everything. We will provide training. We will provide uh, other kinds of expertise to help the business succeed. But the thing is that it is not about, about simply letting individuals make a lot of money. Uh, it is about trying to develop a national economy, and the only reason we even have a 49% uh, stake that somebody can have is because it functions as an incentive for some people who want to engage in developing our own economic life. But I, I'm one who's willing to, to, to invest uh, in our future, invest in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an independent economy for Africa with my own dollars, my own resources, and everybody is going to have to be able to do that if Africa is an African people are to ever know freedom. That's what it's going to take. White folks got a free ride. They got stolen land. They got stolen labor. We ain't got none of that and don't want any of that. And uh, our incentive has to be a recognition that we are part of a dispersed nation, that the only way we will ever know freedom again is that we must take back our freedom, take back our resources, take back our land, and we have to do everything that's within our power to contribute to that effort. So we have the ability now, and there's going to be discussion in this meeting about Black Star Industries, and where much more will be, un will be shown to you about what it is that we are doing and trying to do. And you're going to be called on, just like I'm calling on you to join this party Join this movement. Let's get away from just going to events for events' sake. Let's get away from simply being consumers of information and join in this incredibly significant historical trajectory that peoples around the world are engaged in overturning the relationship that we have with white power and imperialism. Imperialism as we know it is dead. It doesn't mean that imperialism is dead. It means imperialism as we know it. And part of the crisis of, of capitalism, the crisis of imperialism, part of it is is the crisis of white people losing power in a state of decline. The whole white world is in a state of decline. That includes this country as well. That's why Barack Hussein Obama is their mouthpiece today. But even as white power is losing, it's losing to what? It's losing to people in Afghanistan. It's losing to people all over South America that, was, uh, that you could see in, in people like Hugo Chavez and Evo Morales in Bolivia. It's losing in those places, but it's also losing in contest with hungrier capitalist forces that are emerging, like China and India. This is, becomes a part of the crisis of imperialism. So just because white power is dying out, just because imperialism as we know it is dying, that doesn't mean we are winning. In order for us to win, we must be organized and committed to changing this relationship we have with imperialism. I want to say this, and then I shall move. I've been told that I, and you're right, I've talked too long. I want to say this, that when we say organize, we are not talking about joining the NAACP. If you want to join, that's your affair. Go do it. You know, you're in the wrong joint right now. We're not talking about just the situation that has come subsequent to the defeat of this revolution. We've got a place where people just get used to going to events. They black because they defend the gender of this. They black because they defend Mumia. They black because they do such and such a thing. They black because they like this on Facebook. Uh, uh, et cetera. We got a lot of, we got a lot of um, uh, what do you call it, uh, social media militants and the rest of it that substitutes for re revolutionary activity. We need revolutionaries. We need professional revolutionaries. We need people who are willing to make the sacrifices and who have the kind of discipline that it takes to win freedom. This ain't no, this, ain't, this is not a party that we are talking about. This is talking about overturning by intervening in history and taking and seizing its history so that it serves us as a people, so that Africa can become our possession again, so that the birthrights of our children can come into our possession. 
that's a whole different story. And uh, we don't mind observers, and there are a lot of people who like to sit around and watch history go by. But what we are most interested in is people who want to make history. And that's a whole different thing. They have to, part of that means that you've got to relearn the way you think and understand everything. Because the truth of the matter is we don't know nothing. The party has worked for 40 years now, developing our theory, developing organization, developing our political line, and you're invited to come in, join this process, and then, and then we can do something to change the way the world is and to guarantee that Africa and African people have a future. I thank you so much for your patience. I want to say all power to the people. E is way late too. E Africa. E is way late too. E Africa. One Africa. One Africa. One nation. Uhuru. <laughs>